I, I continue um, to forget each time to let everybody know that we are recording the, the meeting. So watch what you say. And um, we generally will post on our YouTube channel, we will only post the uh, speaker portion, um, but you never know. Uh, because it's being recorded, it might show up. You never know where. And I'd like to welcome everybody to our January 2021 general membership REA meeting. Uh -huh. It's uh, uh, by way of introductory comments, I was going to say that 2021 was got to be better than 2020, but given last week's events, I'm not sure that that's the case. But I do hope that uh, you are all well. Um, if you could if you could mute yourself so that we don't hear you in the background, that would be great. Um, we, we missed having in December our holiday party. We, that's always a, a, a fun time and we missed having it, but I'd like to let you know that we're optimistic that the vaccines will get rolled out in time that we can have a holiday party next year. And we reserved a date in December, I think December 14th, if my recollection is correct. So we'll all count on that. One of the things that we annually do at our holiday party is announce the winner of the person that the REA board selects as an individual who has contributed a lot to REA and or uh, retiree issues. And uh, although if we put it in the newsletter, I would like to again mention the fact that the award, the wordy this year is Janet Wood, who has been a board member and the REA newsletter editor for 10 years, if you can believe it. And she, she's done just a great job. Um, she came to us uh, a few months back and said that she wanted to retire from that, spend some time doing some other things. And uh, again, I'd like to just acknowledge the fact that she has been selected by the board. The board is giving her a, a, a Tivo, Tivoli ref radio FAM FM radio that we're going to comes in a nice wooden case and it'll get inscribed with her name and our thanks for her doing a great job um and she's been on the board for these past 10 years as a as the newsletter editor and it's really we really owe a lot she's not on the call because she has has other obligations today but we will I will pass along these words to her um Today represents the first day of several new officers or officers that are starting new terms today. Uh, November is always when we elect a portion of the officers and uh, board members. And this past November, um, a slate was presented to the board by our nominating committee uh, that was then put to the membership at the November election and they were unanimously re re uh, approved by the membership. And so starting today, that, that's a new term. These are all re individuals who were previously in their positions, but I'd like to acknowledge them and thank them in advance for this new term. And those people are Brad Jacobson, the secretary, Karen Butler, the treasurer, and two board members, Shirley Weber and Joan McNamara. So you are officially inducted and you begin your terms now. In November, I was, I was out of town, but in November we had a good meeting. We had a great presentation from Dr. Carl Luna. It was particularly interesting because he always gives us his insights, um, political insights. And of course this year it was extremely good. And again, our, we post our, our presentations on our REA web, uh, excuse me, YouTube channel. So if you missed it, it's a good one. I'd encourage you all to go check it out. Okay. Um, I'd like to mention that the minutes of the November meeting are posted on our website. Uh, when we used to meet in person in the old days, uh, we would have the membership uh, approve them, but we're skipping that nowadays uh, because of the Zoom thing. But if you want to review the minutes, they're always posted. They should be always posted by the time of this meeting on our website. And so I would encourage you, if you're, if you're interested, if you're concerned about anything missing or uh, that you want
want to make it uh, changes to that to review that. Um, we also have our board minutes on on the website. So if you want to know what what the board is doing, that's the way to do it. Our treasurer's report has um, been completed. Um, our treasurer, Karen Butler, who was just reelected to another two year term, uh, completes the reports. And again, um, we, if we were meeting in person, we would have copies available at the back of the room, but because we don't, if you wish to have a copy of the December uh, year end report, um, just email Karen and she will be happy to email you back a copy of the report. At this point, I'd like to ask Chris Brewster, uh, who's on our board and is kind of our resident expert on litigation that occurs on our pension issues and so forth to give the membership an update about the Proposition B um, legal situation. Chris? Yeah, thanks, Dick. Um, I'll try to make this as brief as I can, but give you a, a full overview. Um, you remember that um, after Proposition B was enacted, uh, several of the unions filed uh, a complaint with the Public Employee Relations Board that it violated state labor law, and the PERB issued a ruling that would have essentially invalidated Prop B. Uh, but that was appealed through the court system to all the way to the California Supreme Court by two plaintiffs, the city of San Diego and April Bowling et al., uh, some private parties uh, who had promoted Proposition B. During the appeal process, the new employees, as you know, received 401ks instead of being enrolled in the pension system. And the Supreme Court ultimately ruled against the plaintiffs, sent this back to the appeals court which essentially ruled further in accordance um, with the Supreme Court's decision that uh, Proposition B should be overturned. The city has now uh, changed its position and agrees uh, to the need to invalidate Prop B, but uh, bowling, April bowling at all, the remaining plaintiffs haven't. So legal opposition to invalidating Prop B has continued. One of the final uh, key steps in this invalidation process uh, is a quo warranto ruling that would direct the city of San Diego to remove all of the language from the city charter that was placed there through uh, the Proposition B uh, vote. That requires a ruling by a superior court judge and then an action by the San Diego City Council. The judge just recently, and you may have seen this in the paper, um, ruled verbally um, from the bench in favor of this quo warranto removal of Prop B language from the charter. And his written ruling is expected within the next 10 days. So, but he's already indicated that that's what his ruling is gonna be. Once that ruling is uh, published, it can be appealed by April Bowling by the um, plaintiffs uh, uh, to the appeals court um, if they wish to do so. And it's unknown whether they will at this point. Um, they would have 60 days to appeal. If they appeal, the appeal may take as long as 18 months. It go, go, would go back to the appeals court. Um, if they don't appeal, then after the 60 day period, the city council can act fairly quickly for, through the normal legislative process. If it goes that way, if there is no appeal um, and the city council acts accordingly, uh, two things will happen. First, all new employees in classifications eligible to be part of the pension system uh, prior to Prop B uh, will be made a part of the pension system. So going forward, prospectively, all new employees eligible will go into the pension system just as they would have prior to Prop B. Um, second, the unions will meet and confer with the city to determine how the approximately 4,000 employees uh, who have been denied a pension in the intervening period will be handled. Um, it's notable that the herb order included a ruling that would quote unquote, make the affected employees whole for lost pension benefits plus 7% interest. So the unions have some substantial leverage in those meet and confer negotiations. Again, if the judge's ruling is appealed, then all of this would be postponed by up to 18 months, depending on how quickly the appeals court uh, moves to deal with the case. They could, um, they could move quickly or it could take the typical 
um, 18 months on their calendar. Um, I just want to make a point that of saying that really all of this is, uh, I, I would say that the, the kudos go the, uh, to Ann Smith, the attorney, the lead attorney on this on behalf of the four uh, unions involved. Um, she's just done an unbelievable job of shepherding this through the entire process. And um, uh, we're very close to success on seeing uh, the city's uh, pension restored to what it was before for all employees. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. This is an important issue. I, I know that um, having myself been a board member on the SERS, SERS Board of Trustees as an elected retired representative now how You muted yourself, Dick. I don't know how I did that. Um, the, the pension system would see its uh, numbers reduced. And as the pension system reduces its numbers, then financially it gets more difficult. You get more um, volatile relationships and so forth. So this is good because it's going to make sure that, that we help uh, on a going forward basis with keeping the pension system sound financially. So thank you, Chris, appreciate that very much. At this point, I'd like to introduce uh, Cynthia Queen and Marcel Rossman to give us uh, their reports uh, from SERPs. Thank Cynthia? you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much, Dick. And thanks to all of you who are serving on your REA board. Appreciate your service to the community and to our system overall. I have a couple things I wanted to share. It's January and that means it's also 1099 season, a project that we um, take very seriously and importantly and we prepare for in advance. And so, as you know, the federal law requires that the 1099 forms are mailed by January 31st, but our goal is to beat that uh, timeline by a lot. So we have a very aggressive timeline. We are right on track with that. And in addition to getting those 1099s out um, as soon as possible, they will also be posted on our member portal. And I would like to offer that when we, um, when the 1099s are mailed, I will let REA know so that you can share that with your members if, if you like, so that people will know when to look for them and know when they will be available on the member portal. We appreciate you filing your taxes timely. So thank you for that. Quick update on what had, what's been happening over on this end of uh, the world when you think maybe things are quiet, but actually the end of the year was a big deal at SD SERS. There was a, um, a, change um, in the drop interest rates, which can affect people's um, timing of their retirement if they were kind of close to that. So with that and probably a number of other things, we had uh, about 200 people retire by the um, in December, which is like three times as much as usual. It's a very, very high number. The great thing was we certainly expected that this could happen. And so we really, um, as an entire staff, we planned together and had a comprehensive outreach plan. I have to give a shout out to Jessica Maloney, who's our communications manager and on this call because she's just a rock star and putting it all together. And it's, you can never communicate enough, as you all know. And so it wasn't just all the information online and, and um, the information our team was sharing, but um, we sent an, a, a letter to every person who was in drop, letting them know trying to give them an idea of what was going on and to make sure everyone knows that we're still doing our counseling appointments via phone. So at any rate, it worked out very well. I really appreciate the whole team. And that's just a part of what was going on. And I would like to turn it over to our deputy Sec uh, chief executive officer, Marcel Voorhees Rossman, who will tell you about the your health, which is also um, health reimbursements, which are also important to you. So thank you, Marcel. Good morning, everyone. So we kind of got a double whammy in a uh, at SD SERS for the month of December. So we had that significant increase in the number of people retiring. We also, as we normally do have this time of year, had a significant increase in the number of reimbursement requests for those uh, retirees who have retiree health allowances. Our average is about 950 requests a month. In December, we had a 1,000% increase in requests for Medicare reimbursements. That's because the Medicare Part B premium went up. So any members who were getting reimbursed for that submitted their requests. So um, normally we get about 150 requests for Medicare reimbursements every month. In December, we got 1,500. Again, a 1,000% increase. 
So we are doing our best to get through all of these. Again, just as we knew that we had the increase in retirements coming, we also knew that we were gonna have this increase in the Medicare reimbursements coming. We've pulled staff from other divisions to help with this and we are working feverishly on it and we are on track to get through all of these in time for the January payroll. I just wanna let you know, please be patient with us. We are working very hard on this and we appreciate the diligence in retirees submitting their information as soon as possible. Um, some retirees are a little more diligent than others. I had one retiree who actually provided the documentation seven times. So that meant seven times we had to go through their paperwork and determine that we already got it. And the next six times we didn't actually need to process. So um, I know it's, it's frustrating sometimes if you don't hear back from us right away, but keep in mind, we are talking about a significant increase and we are working very hard to make sure that we get them all processed. So we may not be responding to emails as quickly as we normally are on um, people have been emailing, hey, did you get my stuff? It's like, Probably so, but we, um, we're trying to get through, as I said, you know, 1,500 of these that um, we got this month. So again, we are working very hard on it. We anticipate that we will meet those timelines and we will get all of these processed in time for the January payroll. And it looks like, I don't know if I accidentally raised my hand or if somebody else raised a hand. All right, thank you, Marcel and Cynthia. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Appreciate the update and the hard work. You guys are doing a great job. I'd like to now ask Dave Toomey to give us an update on our image enhancement initiative. Dave? You're, you're muted, Dave. You got to unmute. There you go. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, most of you know about eight months ago, we started a um, an image campaign. And the idea was to raise the, uh, the awareness in the community that there are city employee retirees out there in the community doing good things, contributing. And also it's a, there's some spin-offs to that with uh, elected officials. Uh, it's just improving image. And uh, we had a pretty uh, good first uh, half, uh, last half of uh, 2020, uh, with some particular things to celebrate. One, and most important, I think uh, most significant, is our partnership with Voice of San Diego. Um, that is just one of, one of the really good things that we, that we accomplished last year. I just uh, received from them this morning, where we, we sponsored their uh, signature uh, piece, which is the morning report. It comes out Monday through Friday, 52 uh, weeks a year. And we have had our banner at the top, REA, uh, still active in the community, and we have a footer down there with our logo. Um, that was on 19 times during the last second half of, uh, of last year. And just this morning, I received from them a uh, summary of, uh, of how effective that was. And uh, they are citing that on an average, viewership was 21,000 350 people per morning report. And 159 people clicked on the link uh, to see and, uh, and read more about REA. So that is, that's, and we're gonna pursue that next year, uh, this, this year, uh, increase that, that activity there. It's just uh, it's, it's really uh, working very well for us and for them and for uh, Voice of San Diego. The second thing we did, I'll be quick with this, Dick, we did uh, participated in the uh, food banks, virtual food drive. And this was really a great event. Uh, so easy to do, uh, it just uh, for anybody wanting to contribute, uh, you could do it all virtually, do it all online. Uh, we got a report back from them that we uh, we raised $2,900 $2, for the food bank 
which is enough to feed uh, 15,000, provide 13,000 meals. So that's a thing we're very proud of and our members should be proud of. And finally, uh, we participated again last year with the uh, Carl Luna and his Restoring Respect Initiative, which uh, this year featured uh, Cindy McCain, who has her own website on, on respect issues. And uh, we were happy to have our own Trudy Sott uh, take part in the closing remarks for that program. So a lot of, a lot of uh, good publicity there as well. So we plan to repeat all those things this year and to add, if we can, if COVID will allow the kids to go back to school, we want to do a National Reading Day event with the Monarch School in downtown San Diego, which is the school for uh, homeless kids. So that's it. Thank you very much, Dave, and for all your hard work on this initiative. And I think the, on behalf of the board and the membership are doing a great job with that program, and we're real, real pleased with it. Uh, with that, I'd like to adjourn our REA business meeting um, so that we can have one of our favorite speakers, uh, who's always a popular draw with, with REA. And uh, this will be the first time that uh, uh, we won't be in person, we'll be online, but I'd like to have uh, Joe Flynn introduce our speaker today. Joe, you got to unmute, Joe. Joe, unmute, unmute. There you go, start. Yeah. Live? Yes. Okay. Th thank you, Dick. Uh, and it is my pleasure again to introduce Scott Lewis from uh, Voice of San Diego. And this is the part where I start with, here is our speaker who needs no introduction. And then I'm obliged thank by you. custom to continue. Scott Lewis, CEO and editor of the Voice of San Diego, our digital news source. Scott has spoken to REA on 15 previous occasions. Obviously, we value and respect the Voice of San Diego, even when we do not always agree. But as has been said by that, uh, that political writer, Walter Lippmann, said, even when he is wrong, he's illuminating. So you're in fine company, Scott. Uh, also, uh, that uh, some of the viewers of Voice of San Diego have noticed that REA is also a proud sponsor. We value this group's uh, investigative reporters and they help us keep up with San Diego. And if you are not already a contributor uh, and that you consider supporting the Voice of San Diego to help you keep up with San Diego as well. So here's Scott very much appreciate your uh, willingness to speak with us again. Thank you, Scott, it's all yours. All right, thank you. Um, I trust you can hear me okay? Yes. Well, thank you for having me 15 times. Wow, I, uh, uh, I've, it's always been a pleasure to come by. I'm, I'm disappointed uh, there's no ribs or something to have. I guess I'll, I'll deal. Um, <laughs> It's always nice to have a, a little meal with you guys and catch up. Uh, I never thought I'd be speaking to you from my garage, but here we are. Uh, it looks like a normal, uh, 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 you know, backdrop, but there's there's the garage part there. So uh, this has been our operation uh, since March. I think you were the last. Yours was the last group I spoke to in person uh, before the shutdown. I remember that week we were still kind of not sure mm -hmm. whether it was going to cause a problem for us or not. And <laughs> I guess they made that clear for us. Um, so I look forward to talking. Uh, I have a couple of slides we could do, or we could just talk. Uh, so uh, if you if you wanted to share the, or allow me to share, I could. Um, uh, we can just go through some things uh, as, uh, uh, okay, cool. Um, well, let's see, um, let me get this going. Um, Oops. Go ahead, Scott. It's your choice. All right. Yeah, we we'll might as well. Um, all right. Hold on.
All right. Well, uh, for those of you who don't know, Voice San Diego, of course, focuses on local public affairs. We try to find things out that people don't want us to find out about and make sense of the ones, uh, the things that they do uh, let us know about. So obviously we watched a, um, uh, a uh, election come through. We have a new mayor. We have an interview up on the uh, Voice San Diego site of his new chief of staff, uh, uh, Paula Avila. She's been working for the last about eight years on um, border issues. And she had a lot to say to us uh, about how big the border is going to be uh, to her and to the administration and just how, um, uh, you know, how crazy it's been to be working on border issues over the last seven years. If you think about it, uh, it's just been an incredible time uh, for the border economy, for the border politics, for border enforcement. Uh, obviously, right now we have a, a unprecedented ongoing border shutdown of, um, of service or, you know, sort of non-essential crossing. Um, also, he came out uh, late uh, last week, talked about uh, the new ruling from um, the, the local judge who said that, indeed, they need to remove Prop B, 2012's Proposition B language from uh, the city charter, uh, and somehow for the 4,000 or so city employees who were hired since 2012, either bring them into the new pen into a pension system like what was there before for uh, non city or non police employees, uh, or otherwise make them whole somehow. It's going to be a really interesting ride for the next couple of years as they try to deal with that. Um, he's got a lot of big challenges, big uh, budget deficit uh, they're going to have to deal with. Uh, so Quite a time to to want to be mayor of the city of San Diego. Ironically, uh, the city is having a lot of financial problems, but I think uh, the county, the school districts, and the state are going to have um, uh, rather significant, um, large budgets, uh, large revenue. Uh, the state had a um, big influx of of money from uh, wealthy individuals paying taxes on some of their earnings over the last year. So uh, the city did not get any of that uh, <clears throat> benefit. Maybe the state will provide some uh, support, but uh, it's a tough time to be mayor, but um, he signed up for it. Uh, we have five new city council members. Um, they had to jump right in uh, with a big decision about who should be council president. And they went with Jennifer Campbell. Uh, big uh, tension, ten, tension um, for that discussion. I've never seen the council president discussion becomes such a political and public discussion. Usually it's kind of handled behind closed doors and they come out with a, um, you know, a vote that's kind of predetermined. That was, uh, you know, like nine hours of debate and then um, some pretty uh, hurt feelings. Now, uh, Barbara Bree, who lost uh, the election for mayor, announced that day that she was going to help run the campaign to recall Jennifer Campbell, which has been fueled in large part uh, by concerns about uh, short-term vacation rentals and people in that in her district and along the coast who uh, want short-term vacation rentals to be prohibited, end of discussion. Uh, and Jennifer Campbell's tried to uh, go forward with some kind of compromise uh, to cap the number of vacation rentals. Uh, so she has, uh, along with the mayor, a big challenge to both unite the city, protect her own job, and get the city uh, functioning uh, with its uh, with its financial problems. Uh, going forward. So a lot going on there. Also a new board of supervisors where uh, uh, Nathan Fletcher there in the middle, he's been elected uh, the chairperson. He wasn't, uh, they've been doing a rotating uh, chair for a long time at the board of supervisors and he was not in the next rotation. That was Jim Desmond, but uh, with two Democrats joining him on the board, they both, they all decided to make him the chairman and he's going forward right now to, um, uh, to, uh, make a lot of changes, uh, spend some money on things like behavioral health and other issues and homelessness. Uh, so uh, one interesting note I just heard, um, um, Michael Vu, the registrar of voters, is going to move into management at the county and a new registrar of voters is going to take over. Uh, so that's uh, an interesting development there. I think you might see a lot of these staff changes at the county. It, it looks as though the board led by Fletcher, will want to be more active board influential over the staff. As you all well know, uh, often staff can take the assertive position and, and the boards or the councils follow their lead and, and vice versa. So uh, I think we're starting to see an assertive uh, board of supervisors there. Uh, Sarah Jacobs, new uh, congresswoman, 
Uh, she was the first of the local delegation this week to call for President Trump to be removed from office before uh, eight days from now when he's uh, scheduled to be. Uh, yeah, she has some pretty harrowing uh, tales about what happened this week while she or last week while she was at the Capitol. She is clearly determined to be a very vocal and very uh, high profile representative for the area. She has a lot of ambitions. Uh, Susan Davis, who had that seat, of course, before was not interested in being high profile. Uh, so this could be an interesting thing to watch. Uh, and I just heard as well, the chairman of the Republican Party of San Diego, Tony Kravarik is no longer the chairman of the Republican Party of San Diego. Uh, he, uh, they re voted to, um, to endorse his um, chosen successor. He, he nominated and proposed Paula Witzel uh, to take over for him. Um, Paula has still refused to give me an interview. Uh, she uh, just tweeted about four or five days ago um, that she still believes that the, uh, the election was stolen and should be overturned. So that's the direction the Republican Party has decided to, to stick with. Um, so uh, they have uh, very historic uh, losses for the Republican Party. Uh, they have only one seat on the San Diego City Council. I'm sure all of you will remember uh, much different city councils in the past. Um, and now there's only uh, two members of the Board of Supervisors, a, a minority there. Uh, all the legislative contested seats that uh, Republicans used to be um, competitive in are gone. And then there are only one representative in Congress in the East County 40, 50th District. Um, you froze up. Uh, if you can hear me, uh, Scott, you're frozen right now. Oh, no. Am, can yeah. you hear me? You're back. You're back. Oh, sorry. I can uh, prioritize. My, my kids uh, uh, take up some of the... Uh, uh, bandwidth a little bit. Let me uh, um, make sure I prioritize mine real quick. Um, um, just take a second here. All right, that should do it. Uh, so we had a record turnout, 84% um, um, uh, voted, registered uh, register voters. Um, uh, just look at how it's changed. 52% voted for George W. Bush back in 2004, 53% for Barack Obama, and then 54% for Barack Obama, and then 56% for uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton, and then 60% for Biden. You can see the trend pretty clearly there. This is the county of San Diego, obviously the city of San Diego, much uh, more um, to the left than that. Um, <clears throat> here is a chart of COVID hospitalizations uh, ending this is look at December 9th. Uh, look at that. Uh, we were getting really worried when it hit over 500 because that was uh, what it was like um, in the summer when we had this spike. Well, look at where it is going now. Uh, this was uh, from a few days ago. Uh, this uh, it's now peaked and, and gone up to 1700. So look, it's almost doubled since when we were really worried about it. Uh, 400 or more people in ICU uh, care in the county of San Diego right now. The hospital stories are downright terrifying. Uh, they are doing whatever they can to delay ambulances who are waiting to drop off patients. There are patients waiting sometimes days in emergency departments for a spot in the uh, ICUs. Uh, there are a field hospital now open in, uh, in Palomar. Uh, it is, uh, uh, we are starting to really feel uh, the Christmas time effects of people gathering and the spread of the disease. This is real and it's, uh, it is really impacting the hospitals. Um, I uh, uh, followed up on just where we're at with vaccinations. So they're still doing healthcare providers. Uh, it's kind of funny how they've been doing, they're not doing tier one, tier two, two, it's tier one or it's phase one A tier one, phase one A tier two, Phase 1A, Tier 3, uh, basically uh, all healthcare providers and, and other such uh, providers. The next phase, Tier 1B, Phase 1, <laughs> is, uh, is everyone over 75 and educators. And that's next. There's no timeline yet about when that will be opened. Uh, so... Um, I'm sure that's a lot of uh, folks in this group would be, be interested when that happens. 
but that is, it's still healthcare providers and they are admittedly from their perspective going really slow on <laughs> vaccinations as they try to get the healthcare providers prioritized. When they move into that over 75 um, group, that, that's when I think it'll really start to uh, open up and a lot of changes after that. Um, we did a poll a few months ago about, um, about uh, what people were concerned about in the county of San Diego. And it is a really interesting uh, um, collection of issues. Uh, by far, the biggest concern that people had, liberal, moderate, and conservative, was the impact of the coronavirus on the economy. Now, look at when you drill down a little bit more, the impact of the, uh, the health impact of the coronavirus uh, was very concerning to liberals and to moderates, a little less so, but to conservatives, far less. Uh, climate change, very worrying for, for liberals and moderates, far less for conservatives. But then it flips down here. Uh, liberals and moderates, not as concerned about crime, gangs, and drugs, but conservatives, far more. Uh, police mistreatment of color, again, stuff like uh, very big divides in our community about what the worries are. 50% uh, uh, of, of San Diego residents are unable to cover the cost uh, of, um, uh, of housing uh, uh, greater than that, uh, one third of, uh, greater than one third of residents um, are spending, um, I'm sorry, I, I need to review that one. Um, okay, in, in 20 years, uh, 66,000 homes are scheduled to become unaffordable. I'm gonna stop this one uh, and just go back to uh, talking to you all and see if we can't have a discussion. Um, so I got a lot of topics here written. I, I, you guys have a lot of great questions uh, that I'd like to take. Uh, we can talk about politics. We could talk about that Proposition B ruling. I spent a lot of time talking to lawyers for the city and for the um, plaintiffs who, or the, the other side that want to throw out the, the uh, or that want to protect Proposition B. Um, so I could talk about that. We could talk about the recall effort for the council president. Uh, we can talk about what happened last week at the Capitol, uh, Daryl Issa um, and his role in that um, discussion, uh, his, uh, uh, his votes to overturn the election um, and this weird connection that San Diego has uh, about, uh, uh, you know, this, this, what happened in the Capitol. Um, there is a kind of uh, conspiratorial wellness movement that has fit really well with the uh, with uh, San Diegans and was part of the reason that the San Diegan uh, the woman who died in the in the attack on the Capitol was from my neighborhood right here in Ocean Beach. Uh, we can talk about the Port Commission uh, or the new mayor and city council. Happy to talk. I see there's already a couple questions there. Um, who is funding the effort to keep Prop B in place? Well, that's a really good question. So um, uh, the uh, uh, the firm uh, Lounsbury has been running uh, that legal effort, and they're going through a big discussion right now uh, about whether that group of people will decide to fund yet another appeal. I don't know specifically where who's been paying uh, Lounsbury's bills uh, uh, now, um, uh, so I can't answer that. But they are making a decision right now about they they universally say they want to appeal again. Remember the, uh, the Supreme Court has decided that it was, uh, it was an illegal you know, ballot measure. It was, uh, it was illegally passed, but there was still the effort to remove it from the charter. Uh, that was um, what the judge this week said needed to happen. They can still appeal that in the next 60 days to uh, the Court of Appeal and then they could appeal it again farther up, but they're having, um, I, I kind of got the sense it's about a 50-50 uh, call about whether they're going to appeal it or just move on with their lives. I do not know who is funding it until this point. I can look into that, Jim, uh, but that is a big question going forward. Okay, uh, Joan, Joan has her hand up. Yeah. Hi, Scott, it's great having you back with us again. Appreciate Hi, Joan. it. Yeah, thank uh, you. I guess the question that I have is, uh oh, now I just think I forgot my question. <laughs> it had happens to do, to me. But yeah, it happens, you know. Uh, 
more and more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it just went out the window. That's okay. We can go talk. I'll uh, come there. back. I'll come. I'll rethink it. <laughs> All right. No okay. problem. All right. Looks like Michael B down there has one. Me. Hi, Scott. Thanks again. This is very much happy to have you here. Um, you know, in, in, in piggybacking on your um, bringing up the issue of what happened in Washington uh, a week or so ago, a few days ago, anyway, you, you've seen lots of, um, I guess the FBI has come out with um, notice to uh, all the states that they to, to expect some violence perhaps in the state capitals. Um, have you um, picked up anything in your contacts in San Diego as to should we, um, what, is, what is your thoughts about whether we should um, be concerned about any local um, um, issues in that area? Yeah, um, well, actually, two days ago, uh, there was some violence here. Um, uh, there was a, a pro-Trump protest scheduled for Pacific Beach uh, that a group of um, uh, agitators wanted to disrupt, and they did. And uh, there was some violence on both sides. Uh, uh, but I think it's fair to say the agitators were there to, to truly mess with the, the Trump supporters. Um, and uh, uh, it, was, it was pretty ugly, actually. Um, there was some mace uh, involved or pepper spray. Uh, the police uh, and the mayor yesterday asked for any leads on some of the people who were involved in some of the violence there. Um, so I do think there, there is the possibility of some street skirmishes like that in San Diego, um, especially as we get to the 19th and 20th uh, when the um, national um, insurrection efforts are sort of uh, being primed for. So um, there is, I think there is a definite possibility, probably low key, but again, there's, uh, there, is, there is some fiery passions in San Diego on both sides. Um, obviously, San Diego is a very politically, um, um, collectively hostile to Trump, almost in a you know 60, 70 percent range. But um, uh, but there are uh, again a, a weird menagerie of of anti-vaccine activists, uh, wellness conspiracy theories theorists, um, combined with QAnon supporters. And um, and just um, and just plain uh, Trump supporters that um, that are very fired up and and do have some base of support here, and uh, so I do think there is some uh, possibility uh, that uh, that that could that could break out here. I, I I've gotten to the point where I don't predict that it won't be bad anymore because uh, unfortunately uh, I just don't know what's going to happen these days. Thank you, Joan. Joan, you you remember? Yeah. Yeah, I remembered. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> this is back with the Prop B issue because I saw something in the union about possibly, you know, calling for maybe Sanders and or Faulkner and others to to do another proposition drive, you know, to again undo uh, pensions. And I wondered if you've heard anything about that, Scott. There is um, um, there is some appetite for that. Carl DeMaio was agitating a little bit in, along those lines of, you know, I think he blames um, Mayor Jerry Sanders, former Mayor Jerry Sanders, for trying to take too much credit of the uh, initiative and thus making it about him and and him as a city leader. Um, I don't know if the appetite is there to to really mount something and get it on the ballot. Um, uh, and I think that uh, the, you know, it's pensions are just not the same uh, level of, of interest. They don't drive the same level of uh, passions in city politics that they once did. So the city council, for example, would be very hostile to it. Not that they would be required to, um, you know, to put it on but necessarily, but I think it's pretty low probability that they would go through with uh, any effort to put it back on. Um, that said, there's, uh, you know, Chris Kate, the city councilman, uh, April Bowling, uh, TJ Zane, that group is still, um, they're still into it. They still believe that, that the city pensions need to be uh, closed out, that the risk of them being exploited or, or, or enhanced far beyond uh, capacity 
or ability or willingness to fund them is, is something they are still interested in, in pursuing. But um, I think it's still pretty likely, unlikely that they, that they try to mount something new. The enormity of the, com of the complex problem that they have to solve to now, again, make people whole um, uh, and with these existing 401k accounts that, that a lot of people have built up now for what, eight years, six years uh, uh, is going to be um, a challenge of its own. And I think they'll probably focus on that, but we'll see. Do I see did anybody of the monitor see anybody's hand raising? Jim. Chris Brewster. Oh. He had to leave. Chris, no, you're, you're I'm, I'm here. Oh, you're but, here. Okay. But go ahead, Jim. Um, a question to Scott. I had if Pence decides to move on the 25th Amendment process to remove Trump, who's left on the cabinet that would actually vote? And does the fact, as I recall, some of those cabinet members were not confirmed, they're interim. Does that make a difference in who votes? Um, and yes, I realize it's a stretch to invoke the 25th Amendment. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's a big debate from what I've understood about whether the, the, un, um, you know, uh, the, the, the cabinet members that aren't Senate approved uh, have a vote. But I did see a really interesting exchange with uh, as are the Health and Human Services Secretary, they asked him if, if I think it was NPR, asked him if he thought that uh, Trump was able and fit to serve, and he declined to answer. And he himself said, "I'm not going to talk about the 25th Amendment." And um, and NPR said, uh, "Well, I, I hadn't brought that up. <laughs> you know, I just <laughs> asked if you thought he was fit." And he said, "I'm not going to talk about it." Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so I um I think that it it sounds as though Pence has sort of discounted the um the idea um and I don't know that they'll pursue it but uh there is definitely an impeachment effort going forward uh <clears throat> and the impeachment would have the consequence of not allowing Trump to run for uh, uh election again in 2024 so mm -hmm. Um, they might pursue that even after he uh, is replaced in the office. Thanks. That's all I have. I'm sorry, I don't have more insight on, on specifically how the vote would, would legally be carried out. You know, after the cabinet decides that, uh, they, the Congress has three weeks to um, decide whether to approve it or not. And it's, the idea is that he would be removed for that three weeks. And then, of course, you know, he'd be replaced in the office. So the Congress would not have to validate it. But that itself is a is another sort of strain. Other question? Um, yeah, Chris? Yep, yep, thank you. Thanks, Scott. What, what is your uh, sense of the uh, breadth of support and viability of this um, Campbell recall? That's a good question. I talked, I spent some time, um, I've been spending some time researching this uh, and talking to her staff and trying to get a handle on uh, some of the folks they're pulling it off. Uh, it's, it's not that, uh, I did the numbers, I don't have them handy. I think it's like 50,000 um, or 15,000 signatures they need to get and, and thus about 100, 100 to $200,000 in actual, I can get that, um, in actual funding that they would need to pay for signature gatherers now. Uh, that's not a lot of signatures, but in, in you know, one specific region of the city, it, it's not easy. Um, and uh, so I think it's a, I think it's a lift. Um, and I would probably put it at maybe 25, 30% chance of making a ballot. Um, but that's not insignificant. And people really are taking it seriously uh, who, who want to keep, you know, people who want to keep uh, Campbell in office and support her. Um, and one of the big factors I think is, is will somebody like Barbara Bree put some actual cash into it of significance, you know, the, the 50 to a hundred thousand dollars that might be needed to, and if that happens, it will get on the ballot. Now, whether that would be enough to actually, you know, then again, vote to get her out of office, uh, I think is the, is the bigger question. Um, a lot of people at City Hall are pretty bitter about this. She, she didn't have, she didn't um, commit any act of, you know, overt 
criminal corruption or anything like that. There was no uh, specific uh, abuse of staff or anything like that. It was just, it's just mostly fueled by uh, the short-term vacation rental and anxiety about the height increase uh, that she supported for the, for the sports arena area. Uh, those two, you know, uh, they've, they've jumped on board the, the tension she caused by wanting to be council president and some of the, the um, uh, sort of um, hostilities that that drove up, but it's all mostly about the uh, short-term vacation rentals and the, and the height limit stuff. So I think, I think it's mostly unlikely, but again, you know, uh, it just really depends on if somebody writes that check. And, and are the only people who can vote on this, the people in her district then, if this comes yeah. to a vote? Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah District 2, uh, I believe I could, I could get those numbers. I wrote them, but um, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Gary Debussy okay. raised his hand. Gary D, I'm a, I, I'm a supporter of Voice San Diego. Oh. I'd be interested. Oh, hi. Hey. There we are. Yeah, it's, it's me. Hi, Gary uh, Debuchere here. Hi, Scott. This, uh, uh, a lot of things to talk about. <laughs> I'd hate to be mayor right now, but uh, getting back to real estate in San Diego, uh, convention center, do you think they'll try to, um, because of recent decisions, uh, do some active things in that area? And Ash Street, do you have any comments on what's going to happen for our next mayor in those areas? Yeah, so great question. We have a, an investigation, another one about uh, 101 Ash Street coming out, I think, um, next week, hopefully. Um, about kind of how it came together and, and some, some players we found out more about there. Um, I still have not heard one lick about what they're going to do to, to um, uh, about 101 Ash Street, whether they're going to try to rehabilitate it for, for uh, occupation sometime or whether they're just going to uh, try to walk away from it and fight the legal fights about it. I believe that that's a uh, sort of decision going forward uh, right now. Um, uh, it looks like they're going with the let's just fight it out in court and try to walk away as as uh, as whole as possible. Uh, the the uh, investor group that owns the building that's been getting the rent payments from the middle person who the city pays rent to, uh, they um, sued and 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 city sued back and it's a real mess. Um, uh, what was the first part of your question? Uh, the First spot is the convention center. Oh, right. And yeah. So, um, yeah, there is a very high level of optimism that March's Prop C uh, was legitimately passed, even though it got just less than two thirds of the vote. Uh, there has been um, uh, rulings, uh, Supreme Court rulings about similar measures in um, other cities in San Francisco that said, um, those were legal and uh, and and tax increase initiatives that passed, even though they got less than two thirds of the vote because they were citizens initiatives. And that's the exact same theory people have about the measure to raise hotel room taxes and expand the convention center and fund homeless services uh, in San Diego. And so I think the needle in that case has swung all the way to the side of it is now more likely that it'll be imposed as a hotel room tax increase uh, and as a convention center expansion. And so I think that is uh, on the table to be done. There's one problem though, and that's that hotel room taxes are a big fat egg right now. And, um, and so I don't know to what extent that would delay their um, their willingness and ability to borrow the necessary amounts of money to expand the convention center, uh, whether the community is going to be interested in taking on that big of a debt uh, without seeing that industry uh, rebound. And you have to wonder if the convention center industry and that that uh, world, you know, fully bounces back. I think trade shows will. I was talking to an expert the other day who said, yeah, trade shows are probably definitely going to come back about, you know, the, the comic cons, the boat shows, that kind of thing. But are the proctologists, are the, are the you know, are the, the groups that gather, are they going to come back in the same levels as they, they were uh, up until this pandemic and, and how soon will they? And I think those are really big questions uh, that will uh, now face the city that if they get this money, but it doesn't exist because hotel room taxes still haven't uh, picked back up, 
how soon does it does it start to deliver the kind of money that they'd be willing to to borrow against at that level? You know, they were going to borrow eight, you know, nine hundred million dollars uh, and pay that back over the next few decades, and that's a that'd be that's a whole new level of risk uh, that wasn't there in in um, in March. Let me uh, try one, uh, Scott. Uh, has to do with the. SDG and E franchise oh, process. Yeah. Um, and first, a comment. I, I I guess I hadn't followed it as closely as I should, but I was amazed that all of a sudden here, when the franchise is about to expire, that they're opening the proposals, uh, which doesn't leave time for negotiating with the winner. And in this case. Uh, there was only one bid. And, and I guess I would ask you, what's your take on this? How, how did this happen that, that this entire process was such that the timing just seems inept? Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I find the whole thing wild. Um, so stg &E asked like three years ago, hey, can we get this done? Because, you know, this thing, it's not that it doesn't seem like it's coming up that fast, but it will. And we need to get this uh, extended let's just go ahead and take care of it before it gets up to that deadline um and there's a few you could really uh do a lot of writing about what happened that that didn't proceed um it got to the point where they uh, uh they took the bids uh and then you know my understanding was they had to keep them sealed until this you know really interesting public reveal of them and then uh, an auction on the spot of you know of this big thing, but the the mayor uh, Todd Glory when he got in said, "No, let's just look at them and see how many are there." <laughs> and so he opened it up, and and turns out there was just one bid from San Diego Gas and Electric, which was the it had the minimum fee that uh, Kevin Faulkner had laid out that they should have to pay, and um, for both there's you know two of these, and and the, kind of the minimum fee he wanted to pay for both of them, uh, they they went with. The uh, Todd Gloria immediately decided that that was an inadequate um, submission, and thus, um, you know, they would they wanted more time to go over it. Well, SDG&E's obligation to provide the service I think ends like today or something, and so they had to immediately work with SDG&E to come up with an extension. Um, so I believe they've agreed to a six month extension so that we can still get uh, power and gas while they come up with a new arrangement. My take is that I think SDG&E will stick with it. There's basically two options, SDG&E or we municipalize the system. And that would mean we take, talk about borrowing, we would borrow like $3 billion, buy all of the power lines, and, and then we as the city would start to collect all those fees and manage it. So we'd probably take all the SDG&E employees. And the idea is that we would cut a lot of the fad and the profit making, and we'd be able to use that to save money and stuff. Now, as you all well know, there's a lot of obstacles to government pulling that off really well and, and efficiently and saving all that money. But that's the one uh, uh, angle. The other angle is that, and this is what I think they're doing, I think they're going to work really hard to build up that threat of municipalization over the next few months and really push sdg &E to come up with 10 more million dollars or something uh, to fund things like putting solar panels on people's homes that can't afford them to fund, they call it a climate equity fund kind of thing, or to otherwise um, agree to different rate um, um, caps or, or, or just to pay more. So I think that the most likely outcome is that the, over the next few months, they push sdg &E really hard to improve their offer uh, and then, you know, kind of play a game of poker with the, with the, um, the bluff about whether they would go municipalization or not. Um, and maybe it's not a bluff. I think there are a lot of activists in town who would like to see them really follow through with that threat uh, and, um, and who think it would be a lot easier than some of the naysayers. So uh, it's a really interesting debate to watch over the next little while. How seriously do that does Todd Gloria indulge the municipalization plan? Uh, and then what is SDG willing to, to cough up to kind of, um, um, you know, prevent it from happening? So um, great question and, and a really interesting civic drama to follow. 
Yes. Yeah. You got to unmute. Brad? Yeah. No, Brad. Okay. Um, yeah. What do you think about Kevin Faulkner and his run for mayor, especially in light of him endorsing or voting for Trump? Yeah, for governor, huh? So um, I think one of the untold stories is that it's really not that hard to force a recall. Uh, the the uh, populist measures that were put in place a long time ago in California uh, make it very easy for some really wealthy people to force a recall vote. By my estimates, they already have about half the signatures they would need. And thus the other half may only require about $2 million of, of funding to pull off. Now that's a lot of money to me, <laughs> but I think um, again, there's a lot of people with a lot of money who might be willing to, to make that happen. The signatures they have gathered so far are, um, um, are uh, free. I mean, they, they've sent out some e uh, letters, uh, but they, they've not spent money on paid signature gatherers. So the recall, I think, could happen. Now, whether a, a Republican could win that, I think the Democrats would be far better organized, far better funded, and far more united behind Newsom than they were for Gray Davis back in 2003. So that's the recall part. Now, Faulkner decided to endorse the recall. Um, and he's, he's staffed up, lawyered up, everything for a run for governor. He has picked the same political consultant, Jeff Rowe, who's the political consultant for Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley, uh, the senators. And um, he's really leaned into that, uh, to that world. Um, and he's getting a lot of flack for that. Um, so he has this problem because he was seen as kind of uh, independent of Trump for a while. Um, and so that caused him a problem in among California Republicans because they love Trump still. There may, they may be a far smaller um, group of people than people who are not happy with Trump, but they, um, you still have to get through a primary in California. And so if there are people more aligned with Trump and more uh, fired up about it, uh, than Faulkner was, then they could probably get him through or get through the primary easier. John Cox, who ran for governor, put another million dollars into his campaign for governor. He's going to try to fire it up again, another San Diegan. And then there was talk about Rick Grinnell. Some of you might remember him from his service in San Diego. Um, he uh, was, uh, I think, uh, a chief of staff or, or spokesperson for Golding. He, um, uh, he's been a fiery big time leader, uh, head of the uh, intelligence system for, um, for Trump. Uh, uh, you know, he speaks Trump's uh, language. He um, uh, is, uh, is talking about running. So somebody like that gets in, he's going to take a buzzsaw to, uh, to Faulkner's political ambitions. So I think facing all these threats, they decided to, to endorse Trump a week before <laughs> the world of Trump you know, exploded the way that it did. So I think uh, Faulkner's got a really rocky route to winning. That said, look at Faulkner's entire political history, going back to his uh, student days. He ran for student body president at SDSU and lost, but the guy who won fell apart because of a scandal and he took the job. Uh, he ran, uh, Faulkner ran for city council and he lost to Michael Zuckett. Michael Zuckett went down in scandal and then uh, uh, Faulkner took that seat. Faulkner uh, didn't run for mayor, but, he, but Bob Filner did. And then Bob Filner went down in scandal and, and Kevin <laughs> Faulkner took that up. So following that, positioning himself as kind of like the guy waiting, uh, I don't think it's impossible for Gavin Newsom to, to fall apart in some sort of scandal or some sort of problem. You know, he's already stepped in it a few times. So um Never underestimate uh, Kevin Faulkner's ability to kind of slide in when it's <laughs> when it when it makes uh, uh, more sense to. So uh, again, I don't think it's likely. This is a very hostile state to uh, to people who support Trump, and now you can really uh, hang that over Faulkner's uh, neck. But um, uh, Gavin Newsom's in a tough state and tough place, and uh, people are very unhappy now. Who knows? Five months go by. The vaccine takes uh, takes a lot of the pressure off. The economy opens up. 
you know, we could be in a boom time where um, the message about Gavin Newsom's pain and, and, and restrictions uh, doesn't resonate as much. Uh, six months in politics in, in, in this age is, uh, is an eternity. So uh, who knows what could change between now and then. Okay. Um, I, think, I think Jean had a, had a question. She's been trying to get in here for some. All right, great. Thank Jean? you. Jean? Thank you. I have a question about <clears throat> the media and the hospitals giving information. And what I've noticed is that most of the media talk to about three hospitals, but do not talk to Kaiser Permanente. I do not see them quoted. And I'm just curious as to why this would be. By the way, that's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, the big three, UC San Diego Health, uh, Scripps, and Sharp are, are always omnipresent in all of these public uh, discussions, press conferences about the state of hospitals, ICUs, and, and the, the health situation, along with county public health officials. But you're right, yeah, I don't know why uh, Kaiser's absent from that discussion. Um, I guess the only thing I could say is I'll, I'll write that down and see if, if there's something there. That's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Another thing I'd like to say is for everybody who is so uncomfortable in these times that this book on tyranny by Timothy Snyder, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century, small booklet, but it has good uh, ideas as to how to behave, how to deal with what we're going through politically. Thanks for the hey, right. um, Scott, I wanna thank you on behalf of REA for coming back. I, you know, you were here as you, you recalled when you started today, right before the hammer came down, right before we closed. But one thing I remember you saying is that you enjoyed coming and talking to REA and that you would keep coming as long as we gave you lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad that you've gone back on that pledge and you <laughs> agreed to come and talk to us with no lunch. So we really thank you. And I and, um, also want to let you know that REA, our membership, uh, really respects the job that you are doing and that, the, and, and that the Voice of San Diego is doing to our community. I, personally been a member since near the beginning of your organization and we're going to continue to promote uh, joining REA to our membership. Um, we've enjoyed our partnership with you over these past six months and I'm looking forward to entering into a new relationship this this year with, with Voice of San Diego. Um, so on behalf of the board of REA and the general membership, thank you for a your continuing relationship. Thank you for excellent uh, talk today and answering our questions. And we look forward to having you back next year. Thanks. Well, well thank you so much. And, and the support uh, means so much for us. We did not know uh, how we were going to get through this year, whether we would and uh, whether the support would be there for our work to continue. And uh, yeah, it, it was there in, in part, um, in big part from, from you and from others. And uh, I can't thank you enough. Uh, it truly means a lot to, um, to have that feeling of uncertainty and then to know that people uh, valued your service and, and was doing it. And uh, please keep uh, anything, any concerns or ideas come strong, come regularly. I'm ready for it and we can handle it and, and we can talk. And, um, you know, there's like, like you just presented with Kaiser, there's a lot of ideas uh, we would love to take and you guys uh, are, are uh, still hearing a lot in your world and I'd like to hear about it. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. We, uh, we really appreciate it. And with that, we'll, we'll adjourn our meeting and we'll see everybody next month. Thank you all. Thank you, Scott. And that Quick concludes question. our meeting today. Quick question for somebody who was there. Would, did they say Nathan Fletcher was going to be, was possibly going to be recalled? No.
No. no. Who was it he was talking about that they were going to- He was to... talking about uh, Jen Campbell, a new council, a council member. Oh, and then... I, I knew about that one, but when he went into talking about Faulkner and Nathan Fletcher and that-, that... Oh, you're talking Newsom. about the governor, uh, Newsom. Oh, they were talking about him. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Just All right, Jim, anything else, to... Jim? Are we ready to close it out? Good to see you, Bob. You're talking, but you're